Well, I guess I'll be the first commercial guy of the day. Um, probably use a little F acronyms, might be a little more salesy, but you're going to learn something, I promise. So, so those who don't know me, I'm Evan Marks. I'm the VP of Business Development for uh, Teradep. So Teradep was founded just in 2018 by two former U.S. Navy SEALs who really saw uh, an inefficiency in the way that data was being collected and disseminated within the armed forces. Uh, and we're hoping to scale that not only on the DOD side of our business, but also on the commercial side. So we're around 30 plus employees today. We're based in Austin, Texas, and we have an on-water testing facility in Lake Travis near Austin, which we're rapidly losing uh, because of the water level. But, so what we believe really, and you know, because of some of the issues that we're seeing today, we have quite the daunting task in front of us for these 2030 goals. But in order to reach those, we really believe a deeper understanding of the ocean and the lake beds are achievable through technological advancements in robotics, autonomy, and enhanced visualization and scaling that data availability. This is really critical to making better and faster maritime decisions for, uh, for people in the field, as well as the people back in the offices making those decisions. So what we desire at the end of the day here is to create a revolutionary subsea data collection system or platform and a data collection or a data marketplace to drastically reduce the cost of this data collection and dissemination. So how do we plan to do that? Um, so what we offer today is I'll, I'll kind of go over each of these in a, in a brief uh, review, but mainly focusing today on kind of the third piece of that, which is our data platform. But we're in development for a, a long endurance AXV, and we say AXV because it operates on the surface as well as underwater. Uh, this is a diesel electric recharge system that actually allows itself to recharge at sea. Uh, this We've uh, designed it in a way where you can have a, a multi-vehicle autonomy uh, operation where they're actually playing off of each other while surveying, and we can have up to a 30-day mission endurance but again, we'll touch base on that in a minute. Our AUV survey services is what we do today. So we're an AUV-based survey service contractor. We do not own vessel assets, and we're looking to closely work with other uh, survey service providers, not really to compete with you on the survey services side, but we want to be your deep water survey branch. So whenever you have a need for an AUV or you need it for a force multiplied solution, we hope to work with you, and we're doing that with many different partners today. And thirdly is our geospatial data platform, so absolute ocean. That's what really what I'm going to be focusing on today, but I will briefly touch on a few things that I have just mentioned. So our survey service solutions, uh, our, our AEVs, are, are cost-effective alternatives to uh, traditional survey methods and monitoring operations. Uh, our AEVs are self-contained, low logistics modular platforms uh, capable of delivering full geophysical data um, from vessels of opportunity or can even be launched from shore. So what those systems are, are four Teledyne Gavia AUVs. So these are modular platforms. You can see from the length, they're not overly long. They very easily can fit on a vessel of opportunity. Um, they can be outfitted with any number of geophysical sensors, as you see over here on the, uh, on the right. They could be a full geophysical suite. You could be simultaneously running side scan, magnetometer, bathymetric uh, data and cameras and other environmental, sens environmental sensors. Or you might just choose to say, just run a bathymetric mission, uh, which will increase your operational duration of the platform itself. So the platform that's capable of carrying say three batteries, which each battery has an operational duration of around six hours. Um, so the, the, the AUV could effectively operate anywhere from, say, 12 to 18 hours, depending on the sensor suite you have on it. It's also very, because it's modular and uh, very easily uh, uh, takes on additional sensors or additional batteries, once you get it back on the deck, which is a matter of, again, I put two strong individuals could lift it on deck, but I would recommend a, a davit or a crane, but by no means do you need a large A-frame to be able to pick this up. But once on deck, you can switch the batteries within 30 minutes and have it back in the water working. So from a 24 hour operations standpoint, you can be very effective with this solution. And of course, as a force multiply solution, it can operate anywhere from say a meter of water. We have operated in very shallow areas. So even areas where your typical survey vessel is not gonna be able to get 
all the way out to a thousand meters of water. Um, so this has today operated in say a, a force multiply solution where a, a survey, a typical survey launch is surveying alongside of the AUV. And then also as well as when you get to 100, 200, 300 meters and your topside sensors might stop meeting your specifications that are required, you're effectively going to have to go subsea. The way that's being done today, usually typical commercial uh, companies either operate very large platform AUVs like the Hugens and others, or they're using ROVs, uh, which ROVs typically are fairly inefficient um, from the sense that they are only going around a knot, maybe two knots at the most. So if you're looking at pipeline or corridor surveys, uh, it's not a good solution. So in that kind of sweet spot between, uh, again, say 100, 200 meters to 1,000 meters, uh, unless you're operating an ROV or an expensive AUV, uh, this is a really cost-effective solution. Secondly is our long endurance uh, platform. So this is a platform that we're uh, developing in conjunction with cellular robotics that what we've done is actually take a cellular platform, chopped it in half and put a energy recharge module in the center of it. So this effectively has the capability of recharging itself at sea. So your typical AUV operations for these large platform systems are a large vessel with some sort of large recovery system uh, is waiting for an AUV to surface after the batteries die down. It picks it up, puts it on deck, changes the batteries out and puts it back in the water. So that offshore vessel typically is a very expensive large vessel waiting for an AUV and these large platform AUVs are typically very expensive to operate as well. What we've done is effectively remove the need for that topside vessel. So we can operate when the, when the AUV runs low on batteries, it surfaces, kicks on a recharge module that allows within six to 12 hours, depending on what the state it was, could uh, fully recharge its batteries while communicating with us via the satellite link. Secondly, while operating in tandem, the when these operate in pairs, the system on, char on top charging also with a USBL is positioning another one below it. So they're operating in this tandem leapfrog pair, which effectively have the ability, depending on fuel storage, can stay out for somewhere around 30 days at a time, around a thousand nautical miles in range and have full ocean depth capability. So we have uh, one of these today that is in the water that's diving, surveying, surfacing, and recharging. Effectively, we prove that proof of concept. The next solution here, or next, I wouldn't say solution, the next problem that we need to solve is working out how these work tandemly together, uh, as well as operating as a true autonomous surface vessel, as well as an autonomous underwater vessel. So there's different rules of regulations, coal regs, et cetera, how it needs to operate while it's on the surface recharging. Um, so that's work in the mix. Today, like I said, we're operating the Gavia platforms as a low logistics survey solution. Um, hopefully we're going to be able to commercialize this within the next year to two years uh, and look to expand after that. But what we're talking about today, uh, for the most part, is Absolute Ocean. So Absolute Ocean is our cloud-based geospatial data management platform. So we've heard a lot from the government agencies today that uh, have their own data management platforms, which they effectively build and maintain along with some other private entities and partners. Uh, but private industry in general does not have a, a commercial off the shelf, a cost solution for this. Some clients like Geodynamics and like SailDrone and eTrack and others have built some sort of cloud-based data portal solution, but they're maintaining that with their internal personnel and overhead. Um, so, and really they've done that because there's no commercial off the shelf solution offering that today. So what Absolute Ocean does, it gives on-demand ocean access to enterprise business units, departments, customers, regardless of geography. Most hydrographic software we deal with in, in our world is, is executable based software. So executable based software is siloed kind of to a single PC and is often very hard to collaborate on. You could team viewer in, you could see what someone's doing, it's bandwidth constraint, and it's overall not overly conducive to collaborating on geospatial data. The hydrographic community in general hasn't really embraced a whole lot the idea of cloud 
computing and cloud management of data. Um, of course, some have, and some are a little further along than others. But again, on the commercial sense, what we're really striving for is the commercial solution to that. So what's the solution really going to do? It has a few pillars here. So data management is, is obviously one. Most companies, whether you're a government or a commercial organization, you have a lot of data that's sitting in a office somewhere and uh, hard drives that are collecting dust. Oftentimes, you're contractually obligated to hold on to that data for three, four, five years. And at times, you have to recall that data if that client needs it. In order to do that, it's a looking up spreadsheets, going into closets and uploading data and looking at different, uh, different projects to be able to find that. Or if you just wanted to go back to the same project that you've been doing every year, how quickly can your hydrographers put their hands on that data? And obviously time is money. So the longer it takes them to be able to call up historical data, the longer or the more inefficient that you're becoming. So this solution allows you to aggregate all of that data in a single location and all the metadata becomes queryable. So anything from the date, the vessel used, the hydrographer on board, the sensor type, et cetera, is all queryable within the platform. So even if you have thousands of surveys within there, you can very quickly, almost instantly, be able to put your hands on the exact project you need and be able to re-download that uh, raw data. So that's the data management and of course the collaboration. So if, if a hydrographer in the field who has been kind of chicken scratching survey notes and sending it back to the post processor, if they effectively both are being able to, within the same platform, look at the same piece of data, there is an efficiency gain, again, from not needing to read so much in detail of these survey notes. And even if someone's in the field, if a hydrographer went out for the day, collected some data, got back at night to the hotel, put the data up to the cloud, and then went out the next day, the, surf, the processor, whether he be in Houston or Singapore or wherever, could get a notification that says day, Julian Day X, whatever is available. He pulls it back down, starts processing. And if he notices something that was not in the survey notes, oftentimes he's going to have to wait for that individual that was in the field to get back or have to get a hold of him. If there is connectivity, the surveyor now could pull Absolute Ocean up on his phone because it's a cloud-based, browser-based system. It's mobile compatible. He could be looking at the same piece of data that the guy in Singapore is looking at and possibly be able to gain, again, an efficiency by being able to troubleshoot something if there was a a sound velocity issue, if there was a height dropout, wherever it happened to be, you could effectively be able to see that at exactly the same time. So that's the collaborative efficiency you can gain from it. Of course, there's also uh, spatial and temporal searches, as I discussed before. Um, another thing that we're working on here is ATR, so automatic target recognition, which I'll talk to in a bit. We're working along that with some of our industry partners. And then the rapid QA, QC. The rapid QAQC uh, is the idea of how data is passed back and forth today. You're either effectively shipping a hard drive or you're sending a Dropbox link. If you send a Dropbox link, you have no context of what the data is until you download the entire data set, you open up a piece of software, you build a project, open it, and just to get eyes on the data, just to start the QAQC process. Or you're waiting for a hard drive to get to, which could take a day, two days before you get the hard drive, download it, open up a piece of software, build the project, et cetera, before you get eyes on it. Absolute Ocean effectively is, is a geospatial Dropbox. So you can maintain your entire data structure, all your raw data files, all your sound velocity files, et cetera. Everything involved with that project can be into the cloud, but you also have full visualization of your data, your point clouds, your grids, your, uh, your images, everything can be visualized. So before you decide to download X amount of data that takes 12 hours, you effectively have a full visualization of that data. You can do some pretty quick QA, QC to understand, is there holidays in the data? Is there other issues that you need the guy in the field to be able to go back and collect? So if you can catch something while the guy's still in the field, effectively you're removing the need to remobilize, there's a huge efficiency gain to be had. So that's what you can do with a platform like this. So I touched quite a bit about what it is, but maybe we'll briefly say what it is not also. So Absolute Ocean is not a comprehensive hydrographic acquisition or processing software package. We are not a Keras or a SonarWiz or a HiPack or a QPS. There, we are working effectively with those individuals because whatever you choose to collect data with or whatever you choose to process data with, after you do that, how do you manage it? How do you collaborate on it? How do you deliver it? 
that effectively is a, a bit of a white spot of the market that is not overly well being uh, serviced today. So what we want to be able to do is, if, whether you're using HiPack or using QPS, we want to build a seamless workflow where after you collect and process that data, it can get directly into our platform where you then, again, either or manage the data or want to deliver the data back to an end client. So the platform is securely store and manage your geospatial metadata. You can create work groups to collaborate either internally or externally. So each one of these projects that I'll go through how to do this in a second is it, whatever you put data in, it's on a project by project basis. If you want to open that project up from a data security standpoint to a third party outside of your organization, you can do that. So if you're effectively Orange Force and you're working for the CHS or whomever you're working for, you could open up that single project, even though you might have your archival data management in your own enterprise solution, you could have thousands of surveys in there. On a survey by survey basis, you can effectively say, I want this external stakeholder to have access to it. They then get a link in their uh, uh, email. They can click on that link. They get their own visualization within Absolute Ocean and effectively access to all the raw data and visualizations there. So if you're looking to keep a client up to date or you're looking to keep your manager up to date, you have an easy way of being able to single location where you can aggregate this information that anyone can access from anywhere in the world. So again, that also helps maintain your quality control uh, by giving anyone access to this uh, as well and simply upload and, and download data. So again, from the project management standpoint, you can create uh, surveys, what we call, on a project by project basis where you upload files to and anyone else can download files from. You can choose which files you want to render within these, uh, within these projects. So of course, you're going to have lots of raw data here. You're going to have sound velocity files. You're going to have pause pack files, but you're also going to have some point clouds or some uh, grids that you want to render. So you can choose which files you actually want to visualize within the platform and which files you're just looking to store as the geospatial kind of Dropbox solution. Then you create users and groups. As I said, the you could be looking to use Absolute Ocean as a as an enterprise solution and just to manage your data internally and be able to have anyone from the hydrographers to the uh, to the managers, to the project managers, even all the way up to the sales guys and the C-suite individuals that if they want to have access to geospatial data, they have the ability because of the platform's ease of use and usability, they can access this. So what we're trying to do here is you shouldn't have to be a highly trained individual with an expensive piece of software to have access to geospatial data. And right now, that's really what we are in our industry. So what data types are we talking about here? Um, basically, any different geophysical data types. So whether that be bathymetry, backscatter, side scan, SAS imagery. Again, if it's a point cloud, if it's a bathymetric point cloud or a LIDAR point cloud, it doesn't matter. Gridded data, whether that be bathymetric gridded data, whether that be magnetometer gridded data, uh, and then images, whether that be satellite images or size scan images is fine. So the next piece of that here is actually what we want to do with the sub bottom information. So we can store those sub bottom files in the back end as again, that repository, but how do we visualize that data? That's the next kind of one of the next steps that we're working on here. So moving forward, um, What's the next with the platform? Like I mentioned, the sub bottom profile of support. We also need to expand our geodetic support. So right now, because we are in a global uh, visualization platform, uh, we are kind of constrained on the projections. Uh, we had need to build out a more robust geodetic backend to be able to import uh, basically any project with ever, regardless of projection or datum, which we're working on. Next is change analysis. Uh, how do you do some simple change analysis between, say, again, you had a survey one year to the next year. How can we do a, a simple differencing surfaces or a slider? How do we get you to quickly and easily understand whether, again, you're a hydrographer or you're just the guy that's a port manager that was just delivered this data? How do you find value within this platform, even though you might not be a highly trained professional? Raw file support. Uh, of course, like I just mentioned, HiPack, QPS, SonarWiz, they all have their own file. And same thing with the hardware manufacturers, they all have their own file types. So expanding raw file support is, is something obviously we need to focus on as well. And then ATR, so automatic target recognition. So today we have a, a group of dedicated data scientists working on our automatic target recognition algorithms. Um, 
So what we've done so far is, if you can see this, it's a little washed out, but if you look at the, the yellow boxes in the side scan data are what the algorithm picked out and the red boxes are what we've ground truthed. So as of today, we have effectively a working solution. It needs to be better. Uh, as with any machine learning uh, algorithm, what we need is data. We just don't have enough attributed data. Um, so what we're hoping for and looking towards is industry partners with this. And we're working in conjunction with SonarWiz on this to build a kind of bit of a seamless workflow between, if you're looking at kind of the, the industry leading side scan mosaicing software, a lot of people are using SonarWiz. So if you're using sonar wisdom mosaic your size scan data how quickly can you bring that into absolute ocean and be able to actually mark your targets without having to spend weeks or months with a single individual uh, doing that in a manual way a good example of this of the offshore wind farms today in the east coast every every object over 30 centimeters needs to be marked as a target so today that's being done manually uh, so you're paying a very high paid individual just spending a lot of time combing over data to mark these targets where effectively if we could increase your efficiency say even 50 percent we would be saving money but so again this is in its early stages we are looking forward towards working with industry on this we really need attributed data to continue to tweak these models if anyone would be interested in assisting us with that please let me know what we have done actually is we're much further along in the bathymetry side of things so we have, because of the freely available bathymetry data, thanks to NOAA and, and other agencies and partners, we're, we have a lot more attributed bathymetric data. So we are much further along on this. Uh, it's still not fully productized. We're still, again, also looking for additional partners in this. So if this does interest you, please let me know. Uh, so I kind of talked about the commercial enterprise solution where say a single entity uses the absolute ocean as a data management tool or a data deliverable tool or a collaboration tool. And I think effectively that's where we need to start with the platform. The people who are collecting data and analyzing data need to trust the platform, need to feel comfortable with the platform. And once they do, what we hope to do eventually is be able to open this platform up to say a, a freemium type of version where basically anyone that is looking to be able to add geospatial data to a freely available globe can do that. And in order to do that, you know, I, I think that, you know, and oftentimes the, the 2030, especially Seabed and others who are, who are asking industry to please you know, provide data to us, which is again, a valiant effort, I'm, I'm fully behind it. But what we're hoping to do is monetize that data for you. So instead of asking you to give us that data for free, we'd love to be able to monetize that data. So if you put the data in our platform and there is now freely discoverable because the platform is open and simple to use, there could be an NGO or a university or any or a port or someone else that might find value in that data that you collected three years ago that the usage rights have gone out or out, have gone out. Or maybe you ran in out of a, a, a marina uh, while you're multi-beam on, and you happen to say, I collected this basically for free because I was already there doing a job. You go back to the marina and say, hey, this thing's an absolute ocean. If you want it, you sell it to you for pennies on the dollar. A lot of people can't afford to have Fubro or myself with an AUV go out and collect this bathymetric information. And at times, data is available to these people. So if you can build a, a platform that's an aggregation of this data from all these disparate data sets, and you actually give people the incentive to do so by possible monetization, you can effectively, hopefully, start to fill those gaps. Again, future state, it's an interesting concept, but uh, we have to build the platform first. So uh, kind of in conclusion, Absolute ocean. Um, so really the kind of pillars here are, we wanna manage the data and your metadata in one central repository. We wanna be able for you to collaborate internally and externally with different shareholders with the data. We want you to be able to do rapid QA and QC because of the rich kind of visualizations and data layers that we have supplied to you. And we wanna make this easy to use. So this tool, Everyone from a PhD level, PhD level geophysicist all the way down to, again, an engineer or a regulator or a lobbyist or uh, 
even Tim's mother, should be able to use this platform. Because if you have to be, again, an ex, uh, you know, a highly trained professional with expensive piece of software to interact with geospatial data, we need more evangelism than that. We need people to understand how important this is. We need people in our workforce. We need people to understand what we're doing here. And it's not only a matter of our workforce, but it's also a matter of uh, you know, environmentalism, humanity. Like This is important stuff we're working on. How do we get people to understand that? you have to be able to share what we're doing with them. And I think a platform that easily allows people to interact with this data and find value in this data is very important to that. Um, so again, at the end of the day, stop shipping data around. There's no need for software executables. This is a cloud-based platform that I'm really hoping that our industry starts to come around to the big data issues that we deal with today. I, I'm not saying necessarily been solved by other markets, but there's other markets that have uh, leveraged other technologies and capabilities and I've gotten much further along than where we stand today uh, and I'm really hoping we can continue to push that far here in the marine side so with that instead of a uh, absolute ocean serves as a geospatial data management system where data sets can be stored visualized queried and shared by users with years of experience or little or no scientific background Based on CZM's 3D geospatial platform, the interface allows for easy location of and viewing of multi-beam, side scan, SAS, magnetometer, sub-bottom, and other types of digital data files. File metadata boxes and depth keys display relevant data and available file types for each location. File types such as gridded or point cloud bathy can be easily selected and switch between Easy to access tools are provided for quick measurements of distances, areas, bottom section profiles, and opening groups of data files. The smooth pan, tilt, and zoom operation allows for easy inspection of areas and objects or infrastructure features of interest. Multiple files and file types can be opened in the same area at the same time, allowing for draping, combining, or simply layering one type of file over another to create different perspectives Illustrated here with the combining of both multi beam and side scan data images. Support for 2D images and 3D point clouds in the same area allows for enhanced visualizations and terrain comparisons by simply toggling them between file types. The advanced tiling capabilities in Absolute Ocean allow for the ability to open multiple files to reveal an area or a region without having to select each file. Even supporting mixed file types, as in this example, where multi-beam, single beam, and aerial LiDAR files all combine for a comprehensive view of the Galveston Bay area. Extensive search capability allows you to find files by name, location, or file type. In this case, a Kraken SAS ultra high resolution file grouping reveals the sunken USS Yankee.
our partner, T. Carney, provided this view of Scarborough Shoal, which is at approximately two meters of resolution. Finally, rich gridded files can take advantage of 3D features inherent in the cesium platform. Additional tools such as vertical exaggerations, as well as this bottom profile tool, are examples of how we greatly enhance the value of this easy to use platform. And that is the absolute ocean. To learn more, go to www.terradepth.com. So within five minutes, you basically just learned how to use that platform. So, you know, going back to our staffing issues, there's turnover in the commercial side, there's turnover in the government side. And effectively, if someone leaves and you got to retrain and you got to hire and you got to look towards all these different software platforms that you need to be experts on, we don't have, we're not going to have revenue from training here. Like we want a platform that you're going to find value in that is scalable, that you'll be able to get someone in that be able to use it within a matter of, of minutes. So again, thank you. Thank you to Northwest Michigan College, the Lakebed 2030 uh, team. Uh, very happy to be here, happy to present here, happy to see some familiar faces. It's been a long couple of years and some new faces here too. So thanks again, guys. If you have any questions, I'm happy to help. Do we have any questions? Um, our other microphone took a little nap, so <laughs> just speak up. Thank you. <laughs> very interesting, very impressive. Just have a question about the you mentioned the spatial temporality. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of temporality, to have old data superseded by new data, are you keeping the phrase to have time series afterwards to analyze the data and then? eventually prediction. Yeah, so the layer management of the solution is akin to what you'd see in layer management in other solutions where you can choose to say if there was a survey from 2012 or 2013, you can choose which one you visualize on top. The next step to doing that is you can do that and kind of flip between them and see differences visually today. What we need to be able to do next is again there's a fine line between what we don't want to be is a is a processing platform we want to work with again Keras's and chimeras but we also feel that you have to be a highly trained individual to use those pieces of software so apparent at times maybe a port director or someone else who's getting this data downstream might just need to understand a quick volume in an area or might need to understand the differences between the two surveys he had previously or again even get to the part of predictive analysis how can i have a a slider bar that shows where those sand waves might be moving so I can start thinking about dredging a year from now, two years from now, etc. So today we maintain that through layer management. In the future, we hope to have other analysis tools that would uh, assist with further assistance with that. Yeah, I didn't mean the analysis per se, but the data layers of different epochs of the same area. Yeah. So often you get rid of the old stuff and you keep only the most recent so by keeping all the layers, you know, area that you revisit every year, it'd be very interesting to analyze after a few years. Sure. So again, from a layer management standpoint, you can have that on a project by project basis. You can have as many different grids as you would like. I mean, it's kind of up to you as the user to how you manage that information from a file naming and management perspective. Um, but you know, not only the multi-beam data, but if you have continuous mag data or sub-bottom data or side scan data, et cetera, you can contextually look at all that together in a way where that being done previously, again, in other software packages is, is possible, but it takes a highly trained individual to be able to do that. All type of spatial data. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Any more questions? Um, so this is maybe kind of unfair question. You explicitly said that you're not generating much yes. Um, but I'm wondering if you're thinking about the architecture of this, did you have a 
the thinking toward a cloud-based uh, data processing and analysis uh, system, or just thinking online from a traditional desktop-based, locally-based, or is it completely agnostic? No, it is 100% cloud-based platform. Um, and what we're moving towards, so I, I want to make the delineation between what, what's happening today and who our partners are, and the fact that we are going to move towards visualization and analysis. So, you know, we're, we that's kind of going to be as well as the data management side of it. But, you know, we will continue, the anal continue to expand the analysis tools to a point, but we're not going to get to the point of an Esri. We're not going to get to the point of a global mapper. Uh, you know, there's there's a time and place for those tools that take, again, highly trained individuals that should be making those those analysis and making decisions regarding that. But where we believe the white spot is, is there's a much there's a very large pool of individuals that need to understand and interact with that geospatial data that just don't have, instead of requiring their GIS guy to ask him to get them something and it takes them four hours or two days to get it to them. Enabling better and faster maritime decisions is kind of our tag. It's like, how, how can we get you this information in, in the decision makers' hands, who quite often aren't necessarily the hydrographers, but someone up the food chain that eventually needs to make some financial decisions related to the information that they see? How can we get them the information as quickly and easily as possible for them to digest that and find value within it? Um, and for them to be able to do that themselves and not always have to rely on uh, another individual within the organization to assist with. That was a long-winded answer. Did that work? Yeah. No, what we hope to see in the industry is, and Keras has started to, but Keras and QPS and HiPAC and others move into the cloud. That way, we have a direct connection with them once they're there, and they can pull and pull, pull and push from our databases, and anyone, again, from anywhere can start to process and be able to push data back into Absolute Ocean. So we, we, we hope that we're starting the move and the march towards a more cloud-based solution, because, again, from a workforce solution, again, like we said, if you have to be in the Gulf of Mexico to be a data processor because you need to be on ships previously, now, everything's going to be unmanned. Things are going to move towards the cloud our total available market of, of hydrographers and processors open up when you can be anywhere in the world. The, the pandemic has proven that. Someone in Nebraska can be processing multi-beam data just as easily as someone in Houston can now. So how do we move our workflows towards that idea? Autonomous applications and, 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 and uh, cloud-based solutions are going to continue to be more and more readily available and the cost of those will continue to come down. So we want to be that commercial off the self solution and be in front of that. Right. Second question, okay. um, unrelated, but uh, you know, you mentioned the applications of um, AI specifically machine learning to target types of information. I'm wondering if you see applications uh, for those technologies, AI machine learning, uh, in other aspects of the world. Yes, yes, we do for sure. Uh, it's early times currently. Um, there's a few things that we have in the works as well that we think that will be very, very useful to the community in general. This is kind of where we're starting with. And we really, as I mentioned, machine learning at the end of the day is, is data driven. We, we don't have enough data. We need partners like yourself that has sitting on massive archives of data, attributed archives of data that also can possibly see inefficiencies in what they're doing today. And we, you know, if we could cut your, if we could cut the time for doing certain processes and projects by enabling you to be able to do that through a cloud-based solution, again, long answer, yes, definitely. It's just where we're starting today. And if we're trying to, I guess, understand where the portal would come into the, into a, a survey and uh, the team in the field, like the files, they could upload those raw from our INS sound velocity file to a, to a portal or to a, like a, so like online, basically to a database in the cloud or storage so location. And then the mobile processor pull down and then they would have to, Locally, the process of sending whatever their software system was, and then 
and then they could save products from that fat into the absolute herb. Yeah, so there's a couple of different workflows to look at. They, and this is kind of where we were mentioning that ideally you're running your processing software into the cloud. So there's no actual no need. Once the data goes into the cloud, there's not a whole lot of need to take it back out. But today, most processing applications are being run on a desktop fashion. So that's correct. If your team, say, is in New York collecting offshore wind data and your processing team is located in Houston, you're either waiting for hard drives to be shipped back and forth or you're waiting for a Dropbox link. What we want to be able to do is instead of not having any context or visualization of that data, so again, either you download an entire dump from a Dropbox link or you get that hard drive, you have Absolute Ocean that can visualize those data products for you to at least give you a general understanding of what the data types are, what the data quality is, what the coverage is, et cetera. And then you can choose which amount of data you need to download to then start processing. Once you process that data, yes, it goes back to the cloud because if you're using it as a data management solution, all your data should be located there eventually. And then if you're delivering that data to Orsted at the end of the day, you can give Orsted access to that project and they could even see you updating it on a daily basis. They could see you or you could say just at the end of the survey, once you're done, they get a link and they have full access, again, visualization and access to the raw data. So today we were the grid that you produced in real time will basically we'll take that grid and visualize it for you. So your high pack grid or your grid from con sys or whatever it is, your point cloud. We're going to store those raw files for you and then whatever grid or point cloud or whatever you produce in real time we're going to visualize that uh within the platform and then as you move to the processing workload correct correct so there's a way where i mean maybe you only use it as a final data deliverable maybe you don't use it in the way that it's a real-time application where someone goes out collects data and puts raw data up maybe at the end of the day it's really just used as a data deliverable tool so maybe you're doing a survey locally someone's processing locally and at the end of the day you want to find a unique way to deliver data to that end client that gives them again a full visualization of that data and access to the raw information instead of sending a hard drive or a dropbox link so it, the, the, the workflow I was discussing with passing raw data back and forth and the rapid QA, QC is, is possible, but maybe your workflow or bandwidth constrained connection isn't going to allow you to do that. Maybe you just want to do something more local and maybe just use it again as a data management tool, a data deliverable tool. It's just a matter of what fits your workflows. Thank you. We do have a question online from Jeff Hobson. And he says, are you looking at tools for the planning of data collection, such as areas of low quality, group planning, and data sharing slash selling between operators? Could you read that again? <laughs> Can I read that? Uh, sure. So, <laughs> of course, um, the so if you do have your archival data information there, you can often use this as a planning tool as well. So we have the ability to display NOAA charts. We have the ability to display archival data. So if you are going into an area, you it's possible that you are using this as a as a planning tool as well. Today, we don't have necessarily the ability to lay out lines or do those other things, but it's a work. It's a it's a workflow that we've considered, but technically it's more of a reference. You can use it as a reference for sure. Uh, and I think that answered the question. Yeah, such as root planning and looking at data of low quality. So again, yeah, you could identify data as low quality data in an area, and you could identify an area where you might want to survey further within your archival data. Yes. Was that the first online question? Did I get the first online question? All right. Yeah, I was going to say the, the commercial guy gets the first online question. But, uh, all right. And I also happy to do a in-person demo. It's right on my laptop over there, so I didn't really 
want to do a full demo while standing up here. That's why we did a little video, but uh, there's things have changed since that video. Things change rapidly with cloud-based software. It's one of the nice parts about it. If it's not executable based, you don't have to wait for the next release and for it to be QAQC. You just refresh your browser and you got the latest and greatest. So uh, if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to do a demonstration as well. And Jeff says that answers my question. Thank you. <laughs>